Hey, what is up guys? It's your boy Speed here, and today we're going to be watching a huge comeback from PSG LGD against eHome Game 2, where they were behind about 10k net worth against what I would consider a lineup that definitely can close out games with good high ground siege from Morphling and good catch from the Bat Rider to enable that high ground siege. Nonetheless, we're going to watch the perspective of nothing to say is Tinker. He's absolutely dominating on this hero, so much so to the point where they're consistently picking it in their games. They even picked it first phase recently, and let's get into it. By the way, guys, if you want to become absolutely broken, well, what you need to do is sign up to the Game Leap website down below right now. The reason why you should do that is because every single day we post a new video there. Content that you simply just will never get on YouTube, we post every single day to the website. It's really top tier stuff. I'm very proud of what I make over there. We also have other creators, many of my great friends who are top tier Dota players creating guides about different heroes, different roles, different items, skill builds, talent builds, everything you need to know to get to the next rank. So if you feel a little bit lost, you're a little bit stuck, click the link down below. I'll see you guys there. And now let's get into the video. All right. So the first fight that really turns around the game is a high ground siege attempt from eHome. So the first play that really comes into kind of griefing this high ground attempt is this lasso. I really don't think most players know what Grimstroke's shard does. If you guys don't know, Grimstroke, if he ink spells a target, it gives them a hard dispel at the end of the ink spell, right? So it's like Abaddon Shield. It purges any stun in the game, right? So Batrider lassos Kunkka here, instantly perch. I don't really know why he lassoed anyway. I mean, I guess the Kunkka could have been Yules at the end of the lasso by the Wyvern. Right. And that would have set up for a, a position where they could, you know, kite this guy out with a rupture. So I kind of get it right. They want to force the fight outside of the base when you're going high ground as, as Batrider or Magnus. Anytime you have a repositioning hero, what you want to do is reposition. Right. That's like the main gist. Now, the next thing that happens is the Tinker goes on Batrider with a hex and they lotus the hex. And I think the Morphling saw this as an opportunity to jump to go in. The problem here is. I just don't see how this is going to work. Like, there's no one who can back him up because Batrider's out of the equation. And then this guy's defense matrix with an Oracle behind him. Like, there's no way you're going to make this work. To be fair, really nice Glimmer Cape from the Oracle here, which completely kites out the jump from the Morph. On top of that, an ulti from the Oracle onto Tinker. And yeah, this high ground siege was kind of just put to a stop. They nearly ended up almost killing the Kunkka in the end, but this was a huge hold from their side because now both ruptures are down. This guy has an Ags and Lasso's down, as well as the BKB and Refresher Orb from Morphling. So there is a huge gap where they do not have these type of cooldowns, right? The only cooldown they might have to wait for is Shapeshift, but he has the Shapeshift cooldown and duration talent. And as a result, they have to wait for almost nothing in comparison to the side of Ehome, who has a Refresher. So one thing that had confused me when I was watching this replay over briefly before making this video was how Tinker was pushing out waves so conveniently in this game. After all, they have Bloodrite, they have a Batrider, they have a Wyvern, they have Waveform, many ways to scout a Tinker. However, the main key component in him pushing down the lanes was surprisingly enough Ninja Gear. Yeah, Ninja Gear, because he never has to show on the minimap, which makes it very hard for pros to react, right? Any players to react. And on top of that, if the smoke breaks, he'll know to blink out. He'll know they're coming and he can disengage. And so, yeah, this item is just ridiculous on this hero. It doesn't get refreshed by rearm, but at the end of the day, you look at the creep waves now. Kunkka pushed out bottom. Lycan has a shard, which is also pushing out bottom now. And this wave clear from LGD is just insane. It's insane. Like, these three heroes just push out waves so hard. And it really creates a situation where Ehome has to decide between staying out on the map and retreating to clear waves. And this is where one of our first gaps on the map comes out. They go out, they have their waves in, right? This is LGD being such a high tier team. They understand the gaps. Pros do this. No one else does this. They know the gaps. Okay, like the hard gaps. 55 on the refresher. We talked about this. Everything is up, right? Obviously, he just used this. Everything is up. They have this gap. It's huge. No refresher. That's freaking massive. And now they're going to take advantage of it. They get the waves out. Fight begins, right? But now this Morphling has to be a little bit hesitant, right? So Batrider goes in, isn't able to get a clean lasso, right? Makes a bit of a mistake. And now the chain hex is going to come out onto the Batrider. And uh, I think Ehome basically has to disengage here. They, they have to be at least very careful. There's no way they can burst this Kunku with the Oracle behind him. And that's exactly what happens. They disengage. And Ehome wins a very big fight, <laughs> as well as snipes a courier. And next appears where the game really turns around. 
Nothing to say is able to pick up an overwhelming blink on the Tinker here, and really what they do well once again is they just create this split pressure, which their team comp is just so incredibly good at doing. To be fair, Ehome has decent wave shove, but at the end of the day, it's really hard to respond to Lycan Shard and, and Kunkka bots, right? Which is what he has. He even he went this second item. I've been seeing it a lot as of late. It saves Kunkas a ton of net worth. Right, because they have bots, so they can just TP around the map on low cooldown. They can TP to split push, TP base. It doesn't cost any gold. It doesn't cost any mana, right? Which is huge. So your TPing, right, is just basically so good. And the movement speed on a hero like Kunkka prevents him from getting kited as much as he usually does. So it's just a fantastic item that really has grown in popularity. I've been seeing it in my pubs as well. Nonetheless, fight breaks out. They catch a Morphling. I was a little bit surprised they didn't hex him here. I mean, I guess they had Lincolns and they didn't have like some great way to pop in. Because they definitely could have like, like led with X and a Hex here. X and the Hex. <laughs> but either way, they didn't do it. They find a Hex onto the Bloodseeker. And the key thing here is that they're going to force out positioning from the enemy. So I love what Nothing to Say does. He understands what I just said, which is forcing out uh, vision or the position of the enemy. When you go on a Bloodseeker like this, even if you don't kill him, it's going to make the supports and the Batrider and the, you know, basically react. And you're going to be able to see where people are. So he, predicting this, blinks back, right? He's like, okay, I, I'm going to kite out. He even TP space, right? He TP space. This might seem insane. How many thinkers do you think would do this? Basically none, but he gets the concept here. He knows when they go on this, this Bloodseeker, chaos ensues. This is where Tinker thrives. When chaos ensues, it's hard to find the Tinker. On top of that, BKBs get used. People show, people split. You can find your gaps. You are a hero with infinite blinks. You take advantage of this. So now he's able to TP onto the Oracle. This Wyvern overextends, right? Because the chaos is going on. Wyvern's like, oh, I got to help out my team. I got to go in. And now he just gets isolated and killed from full. So just beautifully done from nothing to say. Real patience. And on the back line, I'll quickly bring it up. We'll actually go back and watch this fight from both perspectives. I think it's important. But the Kunkka, I love his item build. He's got, he basically understands that, hey, I just have to front line for my Lycan and my Tinker. Lycan can kind of frontline at this point of the game, but it's not great, especially against Rupture. It's not like he has a Lincoln, so he can't move too far. And so, yeah, he just goes this complete mana build and can just auto attack, auto attack, auto attack, and can actually man up to Morphling because he has Scotty, Sanjin Yasha, and Satanic, which I would argue are the three best items you could buy to man up to a Morphling. And <laughs> dude, I hate Kunkka, man. Look at this. Look at this cleave here. Watch this. What is that, man? I don't like that Kunkka has a two-second Tidebreaker cooldown, 70% cleave talent. In particular, I know for a fact, I can tell you guys this right now. I'm calling, all right? Next patch notes, this 70% Tidebreaker cleave at 20 is going to get nerfed or moved. It's just too good. 70% cleave is just nutty in the mid to late game. And you get a level 20, like, which is not even late into the game, bro. Like, it's like a minute 30 or less. Like, it's it's insane. Look at this Bane. I mean, Bane was low to be fair, but man, this Bane would have died from like half. <laughs> uh, I bet he didn't even try to do that, man. He was just hitting the Morphling. He just kills him. All right, moving here, we see a, a very weird smoke. The reason why I call it a weird smoke is they didn't have vision on anybody. On top of that, they're even lacking tier twos in multiple lanes. So very often what you'll see from pro teams, I mean, the most common Dota play by far is get Aegis. And when, when you're ahead, which they are now by a lot, when you're ahead, what you do is you just get the tier twos, right? But they clearly don't want to do that. I can understand why. Uh, sieging towers against a Wyvern Q, a Rupture, and a Lasso is wildly dangerous. They don't have a good siege hero. You might be like, oh, Lycan units. Like, yes, absolutely, Lycan units, and they're doing that. But, you know, if they were to send a hero, that might not go too well. Uh, they do actually walk up with Kunkka here, so tower's already dead. Well, Inks will potentially prevent the... Uh, the lasso preemptive, but they, they, it looks like they were looking for a pick. There we go. Okay, so here's the jump. So this, I kind of like this, right? This is some advanced stuff. It, it's really what LGD does here that's incredible is they're messing with the perception of Ehome. So naturally what's going to go through Batrider's head here, because if you're trying to like gain MMR, you have to be able to get inside other people's heads, not just your own. Most people only have the capability to essentially think what they're thinking right makes sense you have to be able to like and i'll constantly in game try to think what the other opponents are thinking based on like i put myself in their shoes and i'll do this subconsciously right or, or intuitively and so here what you're seeing is like you see this kunkka here okay what do you expect from lgd you expect oracle here or oracle here grim here you know lycan maybe pushing a bottom something like that and tinker just you know looking to push in top or jungling or something but no they put down a ward ward sentry on the high ground 
and they're gonna jump. This time Tinker has uh, Aegis, so he's gonna be more comfortable to go on the front line. It looks like a pretty good curse, but I don't know if the follow-up's there. Yeah, the follow-up just wasn't there for the curse, and now the Tinker kinda just gets to do whatever he wants. The fight ends and Morphling just couldn't get the burst. I mean, at this point, Morphling's build, I mean, he did go for a Rapier, but once again, the Refresher being down. I mean, I like the Refresher on Morphling. It definitely makes a lot of sense, but at the same time, it has created these huge gaps where he just has 5,000 of useless net worth. And it definitely has like played a big part in LGD being able to force the fight. And I, I really do believe, and I, I, I kind of wish I could ask them a question like LGD, did you guys intentionally, you know, force the fight here because you know this refresher is down? I'd have to imagine the answer is, is partially yes. I mean, it's definitely not fully yes. I'm sure they also just were like, hey, let's catch him off guard, right? The, the, you know, Ehome has been on the front foot, on the the aggressive foot this entire game. All of a sudden, they're not. They might not adapt. You know what I mean? Because Usually how people function in Dota a lot of the time is like if they're winning, if they're having a good game, they're going to play up and they're going to position, you know, that way. But then if they're they all of a sudden start losing, they might not adapt. I like to call this somewhat of the morphling effect, except it's not in the way you would think. The morphling effect as we watch him, I think this game's basically done now as Batrider dies back. But what I call the morphling effect is people will play against morphling as if it's a late game morphling the whole game. So in the laning stage, people won't pressure Morphling because they think that he he's going to like essentially live through everything and be able to fight back in turn. This is also a great example against, let's say, a Lifestealer. People won't go on Lifestealer at level one and level two because when they man up to Lifestealer in the mid game, they're they lose. So their brain, you know, makes the connection. Don't man up to Lifestealer. But that's not useful. <laughs> it's actually a shit connection that your brain has made. But almost everyone makes it at some point or or another in their Dota career, like, don't man up to X hero. Lifestealer being a good example. Lifestealer is not that good at level one. He's not. Lycan, another hero where a lot of the time supports have to run away from him. You, you can bully that hero in the laning stage. He's low armor, right? He's low armor. He He's a hero that just doesn't fight back early on. Wolves are pretty weak. And yet people don't go on him because they're afraid of the mid game version of the hero. And so the sort of the more advanced version of that is like Ehome was winning the whole game. So they're not going to position as if they can get jumped and bursted. That's exactly what happens there. The Batrider gets jumped and bursted and uh, well, he didn't get bursted, but you know, he gets jumped and that puts him into a weird spot where he can't get off a good lasso and they win the fight. Nonetheless, I love that play from LGD. Super high tier stuff. Doesn't surprise me that they are the team that they are. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace. And that's all. But remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below. And I'm out. Peace.